Hi, this is Lara at Elliott Wave Stock Market with an extra update for you for Monday the 11th of January after New York has closed. I'm recording this video about 7.55pm Eastern Standard Time. I was expecting at last analysis that the scenario for a big strong third wave down was most likely and I was expecting to see further downward movement and price increase downward momentum. We've seen a new low for Monday but we're still not seeing the strong increase in momentum I was expecting and the base channel is providing some support. When I look at VIX and RSI, I can see some slight divergence there, and I think it's in my judgment today that that divergence indicates we're probably going to get a bounce from here, and so the leading diagonal scenario has increased in probability, but we still want to use that trend channel at the hourly chart level to differentiate the two ideas. This is a bull wave count. It's bullish at super cycle degree. Once cycle wave 4 is a complete corrective structure, then the bull market should resume. Cycle 4 is either a combination flat or triangle. I'm separating the triangle idea out to a separate chart. All of those structures would provide structural alternation with the zigzag of cycle wave 2. And I'm linking back to super cycle analysis where you can see the bigger picture every day. If cycle 3 is over here at the all-time high and cycle 4 has begun, then we have a zigzag to the downside, a zigzag to the upside, and we'll be looking for a 3 or a 5 down. If we have a 335, then we have a flat correction. If we have a 333, then we have a double flat or combination. And so this downward movement for cycle 4 will be either primary Y, a 3-wave structure, or primary C, a 5-wave structure. Either way to the downside, in the first instance, we're looking at about the same movement. When they start to diverge, I'll have to separate them out into two charts. For now, I'll leave them the same. At this stage, the target for intermediate wave 3 is probably far too high, and it'll need to be recalculated once we have more structure within it. For now, I'll just leave it there. This scenario at the daily chart level from this high works in exactly the same way for bull and bear wave counts. From the end of the zigzag up here, we now have an impulse down for one, a double zigzag up for two complete here most likely, and we now have maybe a leading expanding diagonal or, as presented for the bear wave count, a series of first and second waves in here. Both scenarios are valid. If we have a leading diagonal, we have a zigzag for one, a zigzag for two, a zigzag for three, and four and five. Three is longer than one. 5 is longer than 3, 4 is longer than 2, the trend lines diverge. Within a leading diagonal, subwaves 1 and 3 and 5 are most commonly zigzags, and that's why you see them labelled ABC. They are zigzags within a leading expanding diagonal. When we see leading diagonals in first wave positions, very importantly, they are very often followed by very deep second wave corrections. In this instance, I would expect the second wave correction to follow this leading diagonal to be very deep and probably to end up at the cyan trend line, which should be providing resistance. I've drawn it from this high to this high and extended it on out. Minor wave 2 may not move beyond the start of 1 above 2104.27. The other scenario for cycle 4, which I'm separating out to a separate chart, is a big triangle. This does not work for the indice for many of the other indices, and so I have very little confidence in it. But technically it's possible for the S&P, so we'll publish it. We could have a zigzag over here, a zigzag complete up here, a zigzag now complete down for C, with a 535 and intermediate C is an ending expanding diagonal. We'd need a single or double zigzag up for D, which can't move beyond the end of B for a contracting triangle above 2116.48, but for a barrier triangle, the BD trend line should be essentially flat. What that means in practice is for a barrier triangle, D can end about the same level as B, which in practice means it could end slightly above the end of B, so long as the BD trend line remains 
essentially flat. That is the only Elliott Wave rule which is not black and white that involves some grey area. So this invalidation point for the triangle is not black and white. When D is complete, then another little zigzag down for E should complete the whole structure. This should be actually quite time consuming, taking still a few months. Choppy overlapping sideways movement in an ever decreasing range for a big fourth wave correction at cycle degree. The lower invalidation point for the triangle idea is black and white. For both the barrier and contract and triangle type, C may not move beyond the end of E, sorry, A, below 1867.01, not even the tiniest fraction at any time frame. That invalidation point is absolutely black and white. Okay, let's look at the end of this leading expanding diagonal for a possible first wave. This is the high of pink or minute wave 4. This follows on directly from that first daily chart we went over. And again, within a leading diagonal, subwaves 1, 3 and 5 are most commonly zigzags. And so that's why I'm seeing this downward movement A, B, C for a fifth wave. It's a zigzag within a leading diagonal. Again, it may be over here. The diagonal is expanding, so there's no limit to the length of the fifth wave, unfortunately. We need to see the channel about the zigzag very clearly breached in order to have confirmation that this downward zigzag is over and the next move is underway. This channel is drawn on the hourly chart in exactly the same way. When we draw this channel around a zigzag, it's called a corrective channel using Elliott's technique from the start of A to the end of B with a parallel copy on the end of A. C has a slight overshoot. That's actually a fairly typical look. And I've checked the subdivisions within here on the five minute chart. It does fit. I know it looks a little odd on the hourly chart, but it certainly fits quite nicely on the five minute chart. Again, the zigzag could be over here, and we could be looking at a multi-day bounce, maybe a bounce to last about a couple of weeks to be deeper than the 0.618 Fibonacci ratio, which is at 2027, or just below, so probably to be a big 535 zigzag ending somewhat above that number. When we have A and B within minor wave 2 complete, then I can use the ratio between A and and C to calculate a final target up for it to end and we can start to draw a channel around it. It's absolutely impossible to have a reasonably accurate target at this stage, only to know that it's likely to be very deep and should last a couple of weeks. It may not move above 2104.27. We can have quite a lot of confidence in this idea that we're in a bounce that should last maybe about a couple of weeks if we see a new high above 1986.02. At that stage the other scenario for downward movement presented with the bear wave count will be invalid. But in the first instance use this trend line. If this trend line is clearly breached tomorrow with some upward movement look out for a bounce that should last several days and be quite deep. And this is my preferred bear wave count. When I look at analysis at the monthly and weekly chart level, when I look at divergence with RSI at the price high and that failure swing at the end, it all looks very bearish indeed. The bigger picture is much better supported for this bear wave count. This calls for a big super cycle trend change up here and the start of either a big impulse likely for super cycle wave C or a big flat correction for super cycle wave Y. A huge market crash in the very early stages it has quite a lot of support at the monthly chart level this bear wave count. There is no lower invalidation point for this bear wave count, which means there's no limit to how low this bear market could go, and we would still be in the very early stages. When I look at it at the monthly chart level, I want to label this intermediate wave one as well, not yet primary wave one. It's not low enough, and not low enough, I expect, to be the end of a primary degree wave down here. From the all-time high to the slow here looks like a five wave structure. We have one, a double flat for two, an impulse for three, a zigzag for four, and a slightly truncated fifth wave. 
fifth waves, truncations come after third waves which move too far too fast and this downward movement for minor three certainly fits that description so I have no problem with this truncation down here. A deep deep zigzag for a second wave correction. This will also subdivide as a double zigzag so it doesn't really matter at the stage exactly how we label it. They're of the same family. Intermediate wave 3 would have begun here and at 1428 it would reach 2.618 the length of intermediate wave 1. My target for intermediate wave 3 will remain the same at this stage for quite a long time only when we have the end of minor waves 3 and 4 within the impulse will I be able to add to that target calculation at a second degree. At that stage this target may widen to a small zone or it may change. For now it's going to remain the same for quite some time. Intermediate wave 3 starts here and we have an impulse for 1 and another deep zigzag for 2. The question is what structure is unfolding here? Now we could relabel this as I have for that first chart. A leading expanding diagonal could be complete down here. We could be looking for a deep second wave bounce. Or we could also see a series of overlapping first and second waves and price could be getting ready to move right into the middle of a really big strong third wave down. That is also entirely possible. The target for minuet wave 3, this is the next reasonably, reasonably sized in terms of duration interruption to the downward trend that this wave count would expect. At 1818 minuet wave 3 would reach 2.618 the length of minuet wave 1. But if we have a leading diagonal from here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, as per the scenario on the first chart that I went over, then that target doesn't apply at this stage. It'll need to be recalculated once we get there. If we have a series of overlapping first and second waves, 1, 2 for minute, 1, 2 for minuet, and another 1, 2 for subminuet, this is how the middle of the third wave looks. The high of my minuet 2 is here, here's subminuet 1 and 2, and subminuet 3 would be incomplete. This channel is drawn in exactly the same way on both of the hourly charts, but here it's correctly termed a base channel drawn around subminuet waves 1 and 2, from the start of 1 to the end of 2 with a copy on 1. We had a small overshoot at the end of Monday's session, but price has still not managed to breach the lower edge of the base channel. If this wave count is correct and we are nearing the middle of a very big, very strong third wave down, this base channel absolutely should have been breached. Subminuet wave 3 should be showing a clear, strong increase in downward momentum beyond that seen for subminuet wave 1. We do have some increase in momentum and I've checked today's momentum very carefully beyond this slow down here. We have a slight further increase today. So momentum is increasing, but it's only slight, and the base channel hasn't been breached yet. Those are two warnings that we need to take that diagonal scenario quite seriously at this stage. Here is the line which differentiates the two ideas. Tomorrow, if price breaks above this trend line, I will discard the idea of overlapping first and second waves in favour of a leading diagonal followed by a deep second wave correction. If price breaks above this trend line tomorrow, I will expect price to continue higher with choppy overlapping upward movement for a very deep upward correction. While price remains below this trend line, this scenario will remain viable. The implications are very important. This scenario expects very, very strong downward movement, a strong increase in downward momentum. Basically, it's expecting the S&P to just fall off a cliff for a few days yet. But there are a couple of classic technical analysis indicators today which make me seriously doubt this idea. The invalidation point remains the same when micro 3 is done and micro 4 unfolds, it can't move into wave 1 price territory above 1986.02. Let's just increase the size of this. There are a couple of really important things on this chart that I want to point out. I need to decrease it so we can see the edge. 
I think perhaps clicking on the chart in the actual text article so you can see these important things is probably a better idea than just relying on the video. The first thing I want to point out is RSI. It's just reaching into oversold, but the low in price today is not corresponding with a new low in RSI. RSI is slightly turning up. You can't see it, this chart's too small, so you need to really zoom in. But RSI slightly points up higher, while price has made a new low. That slight divergence is bullish, and it's common. It doesn't always happen, but it's quite common to see when price finds a low. That favours the leading diagonal and a deep second wave bounce. Price has been falling all these days and it comes again on rising volume. Every time price falls, volume increases. The fall in price is well supported by volume and is not suspicious at all. And that favours the bear wave count, the bigger picture of expecting we're in a bear market. I'm adding the cyan trend line. It's drawn from that low, the last swing low for the bull market back here in October 2014 to the recent August 2015 lows and extended on out. It was touched again here. I'll expect as price comes down, we're probably going to see a bounce about there. Upward movement might find some resistance at this cyan trend line drawn from this high along here and extended on out. We found support here and here. We may well find some resistance. The next line of support for price will be this horizontal trend line close to the August lows. ADX is still clear. ADX is increasing. It's telling us there's a trend and the trend is down. ADX is a lagging indicator though because it must be. It's based on a 14-day moving average. Anything with a moving average is, is lagging. Sorry, it's a lagging indicator, not a leading indicator. And so I use ATR, but also that's based on an average. So again, that's a lagging indicator. I use them in conjunction to see if the market's trending or consolidating. ATR overall is increasing. ADX is increasing, they're both telling us there's a trend and the trend is down, but neither of them are going to tell us exactly when and where a bounce, a correction against the trend is going to begin. RSI and VIX are better for that, Stochastics also is useful for that, we've got a little divergence today with Stochastics as well, price made a new low but Stochastics has turned up, let's have a look at VIX because that's the other important one I noted today, and let's see if we can make that a little bit bigger. Mm. Today, price made a new low and VIX has turned up. This VIX is inverted from stock charts, and so I think it's just a little bit easier to read. At least I find it easier to read. Often, not always, but often when VIX shows that divergence or inverted VIX shows that divergence with price, that's when the swing for price ends. It happened here at the price low on this day, VIX had turned up. At the price low on this day, VIX had turned up, and for both of those moves, that was the end, short term, and we saw a bounce happen there. So let's use this as a really serious indicator. We may well see a bounce about here. I've looked back on this chart. I've used this quite a few times in the past, but I've looked back on this chart to see if there is any instance where this did not work with VIX. I have found one instance on this chart where that didn't work. Here, on this day, price made a new low, but on this day, VIX turned up, and we didn't see the final low in price until the following day. The following day, price turned down to make a new low, and the low was found here, and on that day, when it made a new low, VIX also turned back down. And so this doesn't always work, and that's the problem with Classic and Elliott Wave technical analysis. Things don't always work, they just most often work, so we have to weigh up the balance of probability. At this stage, I would say that small divergence with RSI and the small divergence with VIX and the divergence with stochastics indicates that we're more likely than not to see a bounce at about here. That's all for me today with your S&P analysis, and I hope that all of our members had a most fabulous weekend.